Good morning. Uh, my name is Garth Jestley, uh, and I'm with the Middlefield Group in Toronto. Uh, we are broadcasting to you live from Houston, Texas, Texas, where I'm joined today by uh, Henry Groppe, who is the founder of Groppe, Long and Littell. Uh, Henry's background is in uh, originally chemical engineering, and for the last uh, almost 50 years, uh, Henry and his colleagues uh, have been running a firm which has established itself uh, as a major player in terms of uh, forecasting uh, the outlook for uh, energy supply, uh, consumption, and prices. And indeed, uh, their firm has uh, successfully and accurately forecasted uh, major changes uh, over time in the price of oil and gas. Uh, Henry, prior to founding his firm, uh, worked for various uh, major firms, uh, including uh, Dow Chemical, Monsanto, uh, and the Arabian American Oil Company, where he was stationed uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, our topic today is the outlook for the oil and gas sector. Uh, and uh, Henry, before uh, getting into some detailed questions, I think it would be useful for our viewers uh, if you provided the firm's current view uh, on the outlook for oil and gas, uh, not only in 2005, but more broadly uh, out into the intermediate and longer term future. Sure. <clears throat> Delighted to do that. Uh, our, our view is that uh, we're entering a, a new era uh, in uh, uh, wor the world oil uh, outlook, and it's more clear that we have, uh, have been in that uh, position with the, regarding North American natural gas for the last year or two now, and that is that uh, based entirely on fundamentals, uh, those fundamentals being that with regard to both oil and gas, uh, uh, <clears throat> they, they, they are unique in comparison with uh, the manufacturing sector and that sort of thing, in that uh, uh, they're based on finding and uh, then producing uh, natural resources from finite sized reservoirs, which are from the moment uh, production first is initiated, are continually depleting. And uh, uh, that is very real and escapable. Another very important uh, <clears throat> uh, fundamental is that the exploration for new deposits of oil and gas is a rational process. And by that I mean that uh, uh, the best technology is always used in order to try to find the, the largest deposits because those are the easiest to find and the most profitable. And that inevitably gives you the classic production history curve where in the early stages you make uh, these uh, very, very large uh, uh, <clears throat> discoveries of these big deposits. As you bring those on, production rises rapidly. Uh, in time, uh, they begin to deplete uh, significantly, production begins to fall, and by that time the newer discoveries are too small to offset that. And this is a, uh, this is a, a very significant reality check on the widely held view that uh, with these higher prices all we have to do is more exploration and drilling and uh, uh, we can increase world oil production to uh, any desired level to meet uh, market demand. Uh, the reality check is the United States, where uh, our oil production approximately doubled from about 5 million barrels a day to about uh, <clears throat> 10 million barrels a day in the 25 years after World War II, reached an all-time peak in 1971, and has irreversibly declined roughly 50 percent since then. And this is the most intensely explored uh, and drilled petroleum province in the world. Uh, this was the uh, province in which uh, uh, the greatest number of companies were competing with each other, and it's where most of the technology was developed. And in this last 30 years, with all of the changes we've had in oil uh, prices and demand, and uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, representing 25 percent of all consumption, nothing has been able to reverse that decline and we now are importing well over half of uh, our requirements. <laughs> this has already happened with regard to North American natural gas, so the, 
uh, and this is the most one of the most important points I'd like to get across to all of you who are interested in oil and gas uh, uh, investment, and that is that uh, prices in that, in that sort of long-term picture where production will be irreversibly declining, prices will have to reach the level that's needed to cause consumption uh, to be constrained to match the available supply. And uh, that is a very, very different environment uh, than uh, we've had in the past. And it's one in which uh, we would anticipate strong oil and gas prices for the foreseeable future. Henry, perhaps you could elaborate on that, uh, looking specifically uh, at 2005 and beyond. Uh, where do you see uh, crude prices uh, and where do you see North American natural gas prices? Uh, in regard to, to crude prices, uh, it's important to point out and to anticipate that we with regard to both oil and gas, uh, there's a normal seasonal uh, variation in demand where uh, the, for, for heating reasons, uh, the demand for oil is strongest in the wintertime, uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> the same is true and even more pronounced for natural gas. So uh, absent uh, specific uh, disruptions or one-time events, uh, extreme weather, supply disruptions, we normally find that oil and gas prices reach their annual peak uh, about September or October in anticipation and build up of inventories for the winter, and then normally reach uh, their, their lows uh, generally in February or toward the end of February. So having said that, uh, for this year, we would expect uh, as uh, that seasonal decline occurs, we would expect uh, oil prices to, uh, for WTI to uh, uh, decline to something a little under uh, $40 a barrel, perhaps uh, toward the end of February, and then be back up into the mid-50s in September, October, and uh, averaging uh, of the order of $49 to $50 a barrel for the year. And for uh, natural gas, uh, we would expect prices to, again, with normal weather and no extraneous events, we would expect uh, Henry Hub prices to uh, decline to the, the mid-fives uh, toward the end of February and then be back uh, up above $7 uh, uh, or so in September or October with an average uh, price for the year of probably seven and a quarter or something uh, of, that, uh, of that order. Uh, thank you, Henry. Uh, it seems that oil and gas prices have become much more volatile uh, over the last uh, many months and in recent years. Um, and I think some investors, uh, uh, of course, their uh, feelings about the sector uh, vary with the uh, daily fluctuation in the prices of the commodity. Uh, could you comment on um, volatility generally, uh, what is behind this increasing volatility, and how should investors view that as they look at investing uh, in the oil and gas sector? A, a very, very good question, and uh, uh, for reasons that uh, <coughs> I will touch on, uh, <coughs> volatility is also a very important new ingredient uh, in this changed uh, future for oil and gas. And the reason for that is that uh, uh, th think in terms of, uh, of something as, as complex as the worldwide oil business uh, with uh, that industry now essentially operating at capacity and with uh, uh, seasonal changes in demand, uh, disruptions of various kinds that occur, the variations in weather. And so in the short term, as each of those uh, uh, factors is felt, there's extreme volatility, and particularly uh, when you combine that with the uh, uh, financial marketplace and commodities marketplace, uh, which over the last 15 or 20 years has, uh, has moved toward a shorter and shorter focus until uh, I think most of us, uh, I'm deluged uh, uh, with uh, various kinds of daily energy outlook uh, reports uh, that I get. And, and uh, those, in general, those price fluctuations have nothing to do with the fundamentals. Another uh, significant factor 
uh, bearing on this is the, uh, the emergence of an enormous commitment of investment funds to hedge funds. And uh, uh, the, the energy sector has become a, an energy futures, and then the energy equities as surrogates for those ha have become uh, 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 very important targets for uh, hedge fund uh, investors with uh, a large, large amounts of uh, money relative to some of the liquidity. And then a third and very significant continuing long-term trend, uh, which uh, uh, accentuates this volatility, is the, uh, uh, the, the trend toward uh, just-in-time uh, inventory, as you have in most manufacturing, and that's happening in the oil and gas business. So there's, a, there's been a lot of significant new uh, uh, software and management technology that has uh, decreased the inventories in every part of the chain from uh, crude oil production uh, to all of the inventory policies and in delivering gasoline to you at your neighborhood uh, gasoline station, and therefore uh, a much greater volatile response to any kind of uh, short-term disruptions. But uh, the important thing I'd like to get across is that, uh, is that those, uh, those daily fluctuations uh, have uh, uh, most of the time have almost no impact on these important fundamentals uh, that I described uh, to you at the outset. So if, uh, if you're an, an investor uh, in, uh, in equities, my advice to you would be to uh, uh, read other things on a daily basis <laughs> and, uh, and only think in terms of the, of the fundamental uh, long-term outlook for oil and gas. You might have a little less stomach turmoil, yeah. is that right? Um, <clears throat> Henry, You've talked about the supply side, this, these fundamentals that are coming together to suggest that uh, world oil production is peaking, North American natural gas has peaked. Uh, but what about the demand side? And specifically, um, a common question that we are asked is, uh, you know, what if there is a major economic downturn? What if, for example, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, juggernaut uh, has a hard landing? Um, what is your response to that in terms of its implications for the price of oil? Uh, again, I think the important thing uh, to understand is to uh, reverse one's normal uh, uh, sequence of uh, viewing this. The, the conventional view is that uh, <clears throat> the, it's important to try to forecast what economic growth rates are going to be uh, in, and in terms then of translating those to what that means in terms of, uh, of uh, changes in demand for oil. In this new environment, because uh, oil and energy are an integral part of all economic activity, and we're in this new era where consumption has to be constrained uh, in order to match a declining total supply, uh, it's going to be oil price and energy price that's going to be uh, the major factor determining the level of economic activity in order to, to, to balance uh, the, the demand with the available supply. Okay, so it's not... The cart before it, the horse. The, it's not a question of, the, of how the economy yeah. affects the price of oil, yeah. it's how the price of oil affects the exactly. economy. Um, Henry... Uh, we've had uh, quite a bit of press in Canada lately about uh, to the fact that <clears throat> in Canada, I think over the last decade, something like uh, 200,000 wells have been drilled, virtually all of which have been what we call exploitation wells, just uh, really uh, fine-tuning existing assets with very, very modest amounts, maybe 5% directed uh, to exploration. Um, and there is this view, of course, that the Western Canadian sedimentary basin is very mature, and, and that's been part of the story behind uh, royalty trusts. But is there the possibility that there are major uh, new discoveries uh, to be uh, found? Uh, for example, uh, Talisman just uh, announced a major gas find. Uh, it looks like around 2 TCF. Uh, what would your view be on that? Uh, a very good question. And... <clears throat> We, uh, I'll refer to the experience uh, here in the United States as a reference point. Uh, we've 
uh, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, our oil production peaking 35 years ago and, and so on, and gas production peaking a number of years ago, uh, we are uh, even further along uh, the, the path of, of exploiting uh, what we have more and more rapidly in terms of uh, known reserves uh, and going after harder and harder to, uh, uh, to access uh, oil and gas. <coughs> and uh, a, a very, very uh, thoroughly exploited province, by contrast, uh, the uh, the Canadian province is is only roughly about a quarter as exploited as the U.S. So we feel that uh, there is significant potential, uh, certainly much much more than in the U.S. Uh, for significant uh, exploration. Uh, one of the the the, the ever present uh, topics of discussion whenever any of us get together in the oil business uh, here in Houston is uh, uh, when are the companies going to increase their expenditures for exploration? And uh, uh, the, part of the explanation probably is uh, most of the companies uh, having uh, taken a much more conservative uh, financial view uh, uh, toward, uh, toward this, uh, concentrating on getting their their uh, balance sheets uh, in much greater or order because of the roller coaster ride we've had in uh, in prices in the past, and uh, uh, not quite sure whether this is here to stay. I think is as they see these strong prices prevailing for longer periods of time, there will be an increasing uh, commitment to that, and and not only uh, here in North America but worldwide, of course. Now, having said that, um, I assume that uh, your view remains the same, that notwithstanding this potential that is out there, uh, your view remains that we are in this period of peaking energy production, even taking into account the potential right. for a, that. Right. A, a good way to view that is that uh, <clears throat> on a worldwide basis, uh, <clears throat> we're <clears throat> uh, base worldwide oil production is declining at uh, something roughly of the order of 4 million uh, barrels a day. Uh, therefore, just to maintain stable production would require uh, a, a, a new oil production development uh, equivalent to roughly to all of Saudi Arabia's production every two years. Just not in the cards. Can't, can't be done. And in the case of natural gas, for example, in, uh, in the United States, uh, our base uh, production decline rates on average now are about 30 percent, which means that uh, to, to hold production even, we, <clears throat> we'd have to uh, uh, develop uh, something like uh, uh, 20 billion feet a day of new production every year. Canada is up to a base decline rate annually of, a, of the order of 25 percent, which means that uh, you need to develop uh, four to five billion feet a day of new production just to maintain stable production mm -hmm. can't be done. Mm -hmm. The last time we were together, um, you spoke briefly on the oil sands developments in Canada. Mm -hmm. I know that your firm uh, acted as advisor to the government of Alberta uh, and uh, were instrumental in um, encouraging them <coughs> to book these reserves. Uh, place in Canada, I guess, second to Saudi Arabia in terms of uh, reserves. Um, in light of, you know, Canada's relative political stability, certainly compared to the, the Middle East, um, as well as its proximity to the huge U.S. market, uh, and these higher prices and the fact that the cost of production is, has been declining, is it not possible that these huge resources are going to attract much more capital. Like, is it possible that, in fact, this could become an answer to increasing global production, or are there constraints, just like technical constraints uh, and so on, uh, cost constraints, just availability of labor, uh, that would, uh, would mitigate against that? <clears throat> A very, very important resource for, for Canada and uh, therefore also very important to the United States because uh, Canada is, is 
one of our most important uh, oil suppliers. And in fact, as we do our work and uh, are extending our production forecasts out to 2015, <laughs> disregarding Russia, uh, we have uh, uh, we have Canada surpassing uh, all of the other non-OPEC uh, producers and becoming the largest non-OPEC uh, uh, crude oil producer in the world, primarily because of the continuing significant development uh, of the oil sands. But uh, <clears throat> in in terms of developing quantities of oil to change uh, this long-term outlook and balance. Uh, it's uh, it's again it's 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 just not not feasible. We would, for example, we 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 comfortably feel that by uh, 2010 uh, total oil production in Canada will be something over three million barrels a day, but in the framework I mentioned earlier of needing four million barrels a day of new oil production every year. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's a, a, a formidable challenge. It will certainly attract uh, continuing major investment, uh, one of the most important oil resources in the world. But as as you mentioned in your question, uh, it uh, it uh, imposes uh, important infrastructure and uh, and water and energy requirements, uh, and it's also uh, very very intensive capital investment per barrel of oil recovered and produced, uh, it's not going to be possible to double or triple that production quickly. Right. You mentioned Russia uh, in responding to that question. And Russia, of course, has been very much in the news of late uh, with respect to uh, moves being made by the government on their existing oil companies and so on. <laughs> what's, your, what's your view of the Russian situation? Uh, that, uh, that's that been uh, uh, one of the more important questions with regard to uh, the future world oil balance. And uh, to put it in perspective, <coughs> Russia, <coughs> uh, a third of their, at, at their peak production in the, in the 80s, about a third of their production was uh, about as old as ours. It had peaked the same time that ours did. And in response, uh, the Russians... Uh, moved about 10 years earlier than we did to develop our North Slope production after prices rose in the early 70s <coughs> and, and uh, moved into Western Siberia. And uh, uh, in one of the, the truly impressive industrial developments in world history, in a relatively short period of time, developed 8 million barrels a day of, uh, of new oil production there in a barren environment. And that production reached its peak, total production reached uh, its peak, uh, about 12 and a half million barrels a day in the early 80s, and then began its natural decline. Gorbachev, in response to that, because he needed oil for foreign currency earnings, oil exports, uh, moved <coughs> uh, to uh, uh, and, and invested very, very heavily and took it to another peak of about uh, 13, 13 and a half million barrels a day. But then it began its, uh, uh, its natural decline before the political collapse. With the political collapse, uh, <clears throat> demand uh, uh, declined drastically. Production fell significantly below what would have been the natural decline curve. And <clears throat> then in 1994, uh, the industry was privatized, and the privatized companies brought in <clears throat> Uh, uh, large numbers of people from Halliburton and Schlumberger. And what they did in the last 10 years uh, uh, in adding about 3.5 million barrels a day to their exports and the world oil supply over that 10-year period is uh, they did the easy thing. They just brought production back up to the decline curve. And we think uh, that that's now uh, been pretty much achieved and uh, we think that Russian production will be flat. There's been a lot of interest in major outside investment because it is such a, a large uh, province. And uh, our view from very early in, in watching some of our clients go into Russia 10 years ago uh, was that it was, uh, it was probably unlikely that they would ever really develop a free market economy and would allow foreign investors to 
uh, to really uh, ever profitably engage in exploiting their oil and gas business. And the events of the last year have certainly uh, reinforced uh, that view. So the other thing, too, uh, since oil is so important to the Russian government, it generates the majority of their tax revenue and, and their foreign exchange earnings. <coughs> uh, that uh, uh, <coughs> that, that is, is, is going to be uh, viewed pretty much, we think, in terms of the way the Saudis view their oil business, and that is uh, wanting to achieve maximum current revenue and that uh, that can be achieved more readily uh, by uh, restraining production at times rather than trying to expand continuously production in order to uh, bring prices down and stimulate growth in world demand. And, in fact, there was a very significant meeting held uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, first visit by uh, a ruler of Saudi Arabia uh, to Moscow, Crown Prince Abdullah and Putin met, and we think uh, that meeting uh, was motivated by and resulted in uh, a, an agreed shared view on oil production and pricing policy. Hmm. Speaking of Saudi Arabia, uh, I'm sure our viewers would be interested in, in your current view there. Uh, as you know, uh, from time to time, uh, the Saudis have commented that uh, they could ramp up production beyond current levels, maybe even significantly, and, and I think some people would view that as, again, an answer to uh, the problems that the world is facing in terms of uh, demand exceeding supply. What would be your comment on the Saudi situation uh, generally? Uh, the, probably the most important factor is to recognize uh, that uh, of the order of uh, a half to two-thirds of their total production all comes from uh, uh, the, the one giant field, by far the largest oil field in the world, the Gafor field, and also that it produces a relatively high quality, lower sulfur content uh, uh, oil, and that uh, that giant field has now been producing for uh, something over 60 years. And uh, they have uh, uh, taken uh, the logical steps in sequence uh, <coughs> to exploit the, that prime, prime uh, oil reservoir in that uh, over 20 years ago, uh, it's a, it's a water-drive field, uh, very prolific, high permeability. And over 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, they began injecting seawater in large volume in order <coughs> to maintain reservoir pressures and, and bring the oil out of the ground at high rates. <coughs> uh, they've been injecting about 7 million barrels a day of seawater uh, all during that time. Then about uh, uh, five years ago, and, and these are the normal progressions of, of good field management, uh, they began drilling horizontal wells so that you could continue to uh, exploit without having uh, water break through the, the oil uh, layer and uh, have now drilled a large number of horizontal wells during that time. And then a year or so ago, they began drilling laterals off of those, uh, <coughs> those horizontal wells and even more recently installing automatic water shutoff valves uh, on, those, uh, on those laterals. And uh, in this way, they're able to uh, uh, have good recoveries and high production rates as long as possible. But when that ends, then you, you normally experience uh, uh, relatively high and decreasing decline rates. Uh, uh, a prime example of that has been the UK sector of the North Sea, where uh, they'd used a, a number of, uh, of those methods and then uh, uh, reached uh, the, uh, uh, the end of all of those things that could be done. And we've seen production rates in the UK sector of the North Sea decline at uh, very high continuing rates. And what that implies then is, and they've already embarked on this, is the development 
of, uh, of, of new production to replace that de decline as it, uh, as it appears. And in, in relationship to my earlier remarks about the uh, rational nature of, uh, of the oil exploitation business and exploration, uh, this means they're going to have to be developing smaller fields, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, oil quality that is, uh, is not the equivalent of this from Gulf War. And that, that means much more technology required, much more capital investment per barrel of oil produced. So uh, there's little doubt that they uh, will be able to continue uh, the, the business plan they, in effect, developed and announced some uh, 10 or 12 years ago of maintaining uh, production capacity of the order of 10 to 11 or a little more million barrels per day uh, and with the view of producing 8 to 9 million barrels a day and that uh, that was a plan that would allow them to maintain that production level for many, many decades and to be able to do it in keeping with their available uh, manpower, management, and technical uh, resources. Henry, um, oil-consuming countries, uh, especially the U.S., are struggling to refine uh, heavier crudes as the supply of lighter crudes is unable to accommodate overall demand. Um, as a result, light sweet crude is in shorter supply and prices for these grades are rising while uh, sour crude, crude availability is increasing with commensurate uh, reductions in prices. Why has um, investment in additional refining capacity to handle these uh, heavier crudes uh, been lagging and do you see a change in the situation? That's, uh, that's been a very interesting development and it, it caught uh, nearly everyone by surprise. This was, uh, this was not anticipated and the, the, what occurred uh, has been uh, primarily initially uh, in the United States uh, with the rapid expansion of power generation facilities during the last few years based on natural gas uh, with uh, highly efficient new technology, combined cycle units with uh, uh, heat rate efficiencies or gas consumption per kilowatt hour, roughly half that in, the, in many of the older plants. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, there was a lot of... Uh, of reduced consumption of, of heavy fuel oil here in the United States. And the worldwide fuel, heavy fuel oil market is, uh, is generally a delicate balance, so a significant reduction like this, and some of this has occurred in other parts of the world with the increasing use of gas for power generation. Uh, it, uh, it resulted in a glut of this heavy fuel oil and uh, these wide price differentials that, uh, that opened up. And uh, that, that really only appeared during the last eight or ten months. In response to that now, uh, it, uh, th there's justification for the very uh, heavy investment required uh, to, uh, in effect, convert or destroy uh, the excess heavy oil and conversion to uh, lighter products, distillate and gasoline. And uh, there are serious efforts now. Uh, underway in Asia and Europe to make those kinds of refinery additions in order to do that. But uh, uh, those are big, big investments, and it's going to take a while for, the, uh, for, for those to be completed. Thank you. Some of the news uh, of late has uh, been with respect to the Arctic Ocean. Uh, there are some uh, people who believe that uh, uh, the ice is melting at an accelerated rate, uh, and some people interpret that development to be good news for the oil and gas industry, that there's less ice up there. What would your view on that be? The, 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 probably the, the, the primary reaction I would have, point I would make, is that uh, the major barrier to exploration uh, in, in that region is, uh, is unresolved boundary disputes. And uh, those probably are, uh, are increasing rather than decreasing. 
And with regard to the physical problems involved, uh, it uh, can be roughly compared to your own activity in Canada, and that is you, you, you would prefer uh, uh, icy conditions and very, very cold conditions so that as much of the area as possible is, is permanently under uh, 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 frozen, uh, hard surface conditions on which to do your, your seismic and uh, your drilling activity. So the melting, if, if anything, directionally would make it more difficult to do that than, uh, than, than to improve the ability. So it's, it's bad news, not good news yeah. from the uh, point of view of the oil and gas industry. As uh, conventional natural gas uh, production has declined, uh, there have been more and more forays into uh, less conventional uh, sources. Uh, one of the areas that's quite topical, uh, becoming increasingly topical in Canada, is coal bed methane. I know you've actually had a little personal experience in this area, but perhaps you could uh, comment on coal bed methane for our viewers, uh, your experience, and, and uh, again, is this an area that uh, will uh, result in significant supply additions over time? Uh, this has been uh, a, an important uh, area for uh, development work for many years in the United States, particularly stimulated initially uh, during our gas crisis in the 70s uh, by a very significant, uh, in effect, uh, tax credit uh, for the development and stimulation of unconventional gas sources. And with, uh, <clears throat> with that uh, support, uh, we developed a significant coal bed methane uh, production in the San Juan uh, Basin, uh, New Mexico, uh, Colorado, uh, the Black Warrior Basin in, uh, in Alabama, and then increasingly in other portions of the country. And so we've, we've, uh, there's been uh, a lot of success, and uh, uh, that effort is now being, with much higher prices, is now being extended to uh, new areas, uh, uh, Virginia, West Virginia, Illinois, but it's a it's a very uh, different kind of problem from uh, 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 conventional uh, gas exploration in that uh, <coughs> it's very very difficult to have much confidence in what kinds of recoveries can be achieved uh, until you have actual uh, production experience, uh, and also uh, in the United States, uh, <clears throat> uh, the the initial flush production in the San Juan and in the Black Warrior were in what uh, turned out to be the sweet spots, the best places to be, and that kind of experience uh, uh, could uh, could not be translated to the rest of the area. More recently, the biggest new coal bed methane development in the United States has been in the uh, uh, Powder River Basin in, uh, in Wyoming, and uh, uh, relatively shallow formation, uh, huge numbers of wells drilled there. And again, this, this, uh, this important point that you need the actual production experience uh, usually, you, <clears throat> as you drill and then dewater, production builds up to a very high level, then uh, declines somewhat, and then tapers off and produces at, uh, at good rates then for many, 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 many years. The big surprise in the Powder River was uh, they went through uh, those phases, and then after more production experience, there was a second major decline, and that's caused many of the operators to write down their reserves uh, very significantly. Uh, I've had some of that personal experience in that uh, uh, with partners, uh, we did a lot of coal bed methane uh, work and investment uh, um, a number of years ago. At one point, we had uh, all of the acreage in a very significant basin that had not been exploited. and. Uh, actually had something over a trillion feet of gas in place. Uh, we thought uh, we'd hit the home run, and uh, we drilled the first uh, production 
uh, uh, sort of pod and uh, began dewatering. And uh, this is an old story in the oil business, of course. Uh, about a year and a half later, after we had uh, continually replaced the downhole uh, water removal pumps and had bought the largest such pumps in the world, uh, we decided that there was no money to be made by uh, draining an inexhaustible water reservoir. <laughs> and uh, right. all of that means that there's lots of potential, many places, but we'll not uh, really know how how significant and how major the additions to total gas supply until there's been significant production experience in the new areas. Significant, but more complex in its own ways are different from a, a conventional gas exploration and development. Thank you for that. Uh, Henry, I think we'll uh, wrap up now. I just have one further question for you. I know that uh, your primary expertise is as a forecaster. Um, as an analyst of what's happening in oil and gas fundamentally. That's been your career. But uh, I was wondering if you might uh, just comment, uh, because I know you have a lot of your personal eggs in the oil and gas area, and I think you've indicated to our viewers that uh, you've been involved in more than one uh, oil and gas uh, play personally in the past. Uh, do you have any view on uh, valuation of, of oil and gas equities versus other parts of the market? <coughs> yes. Uh with the with the long term view that i <clears throat> i've described uh uh one in which uh, we're going to have to have sustained high prices in order to restrain consumption uh oil and gas from a very fundamental standpoint in this uh, next long economic cycle uh appears to us to be uh, one of the most attractive uh, investment uh, assets because generally what's good news for the oil and gas business in terms of prices is bad news for the rest of all economic activity and as it becomes clearer and more and more of the view shifts uh, to this long-term outlook that I've described uh, then I think there will be much more investment uh, attention uh, turned to this. Uh, one measure of this is that I think uh, the energy sector at the peak when we had the last oil crisis in the 79 and 1980 uh, represented uh, some 30 percent of, uh, of the total value of the S&P 500. Uh, it got down as low with long periods of oil, low prices in the past to uh, 4 or 5 percent. It's now up to about uh, uh, 7 percent. But it's representing uh, something of the core of, of a quarter of the total earnings of the S and P 500. So, uh, uh, if you if you uh, are able to accept uh, this kind of long-term analysis of tight balances and and strong prices, uh, this sector is still very significantly undervalued. Thank you for that, Henry. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for, for joining us today. We hope you have found uh, this interesting. There are a lot more questions that could be asked, but uh, we'll save those for a future viewing. Uh, thank you for joining us, and have a good day.